thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Laura Baker and I'm a New South Wales AES committee rep and I'll be your facilitator for today. I'm also a principal consultant at ASIL Allen Consulting, a national policy um, advisory and economic consulting firm where I specialise in evaluation. I've been reflecting this morning on the value of acknowledging country and the importance of this opportunity to do a few things. Uh, one is to set the intention uh, that this is a respectful place that celebrates culture and diversity. To remind us of, of the history of First Nations peoples and cultures and their connections with lands, waters, skies and language. And to symbolise the other work that we do day to day in our lives to stand with First Nations peoples. I have the privilege of living and working on Gadigal country in Sydney, and I acknowledge both the traditional custodians of this land that I'm on, but also the many beautiful lands that you're joining from today. And welcome to any First Nations colleagues that are here, and thank you for sharing your wisdom and culture with us. Today's session will be an interactive panel discussion. We will have the opportunity to hear from four panel members on what culturally responsive uh, evaluation and equitable means to them uh, in the context of AI. The panel members will reflect on and discuss some key questions and you'll have the opportunity to ask questions yourself. So please get your fingers into the chat um, and we'll monitor this throughout the session. Our esteemed panel members are Jory Hall, a professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Her work focuses on social inequalities and the overall rigor of social science research. She is also a partner and director at the Centre for Mul Multicultural Policy and Program Evaluation, soon to be rebranded Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Consulting, or JEDI Consulting. Eva Saar is an Indigenous Seri woman, woman of Senegambia in West Africa. She is also a sixth generation Australian woman of Indigenous Celtic, Scottish and Irish descent based in Melbourne. Eva is the CEO and founding director of the Centre for Multicultural Policy and Program Evaluation and JEDI Consulting, which delivers and builds systems, capacity and capability in equity and cultural responsive evaluation practice and more. And Rula Talama, a doctorate graduate at the National Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies at Otago University and currently a lead advisor for the Ministry of Education in New Zealand. She chairs the Refugee Support Group in Dunedin and is a trustee for several organisations that are working in ethnic communities in language and cultural support. And to Greg Masters, he is the Director of Nexus Management Consulting and an advocate for change. He specialises in the public and not-for-profit sectors, including evaluations of a diverse range of programmes. Welcome to all our panel members and welcome to all the guests joining today as well. First question, and I'll throw this over to Eva to respond to. What do we mean by culture? And what do we mean by culturally responsive evaluation? Thank you very much, Laura, and welcome everybody. <clears throat> um, the word culture is complex. It's not a simple concept to measure or disaggregate. It's multifaceted with no single definitive explanation. In anthropology, for example, culture encompasses the beliefs practices, artifacts, and institutions of a group of people. In sociology, culture focuses on the shared practices, values, norms, and symbols of a society. Psychology looks at culture as a set of learned behaviors and norms that influence individuals' thoughts and actions. <clears throat> Linguistics examines how language reflects and shapes cultural practices. Cultural studies investigate power dynamics, identities, and representations with everything from geopolitical cultural contexts to organizational and community cultural contexts. <laughs> it's not only about ancestral or ethnic worldviews and values. It's more complex than this, isn't it? Culture is reflective of all of the rich and varied human experiences, contexts and social realities that we as evaluators navigate day in, day out. Culture is context specific. What is considered culture in one context may not be in another. This complex variability complicates efforts to create a universal definition. However, when we look about, when we think about cultures as evaluators, 
we may hold discussions about cultures that consider accountability to power, dominance and resistance to Jedi, justice, equity, diversity and inclusion. Because cultural hegemony, subcultures, subversion and countercultures can offer insight into how culture can be a site of conflict and negotiation when it comes to decision making about who gets which program resources, why and in which context. When we talk about um, culturally responsive evaluation then, I'd like to first acknowledge that it was first coined by the late Professor Stafford Hood who is a prominent figure in the field of educational evaluation and assessment in the United States. Culturally responsive evaluation includes competence. Yes, it does. But it respectfully is not the same as cultural safety in terms of how our Australian First Nations friends and colleagues define it. Cultural competence as very rightly described in Sharon Gulen and Kathleen Stacey's cultural safety framework, implies full competence of culture other than one's own. I reached out to Auntie Sharon Gulen, who is a Naganjiri nation's elder of South Australia, as I thought through my response to this question. <clears throat> she gave me permission to say, that she said, you can't apply cultural competence because there's no, there are so many different cultural practices among the various First Nations countries in Australia. I would not claim to be cultural competent, culturally competent. For us, we agree with Auntie Sharon. Cultural competence is not something that an evaluator can fully learn, even if they had the lived experience because culture is so complex. It is, however, according to Professor Hall, who is sitting with us here today, an ethical commitment to engaging with the complexity of cultural diversity through a systemic inquiry that involves understanding stakeholders' cultural contexts. Remember the complex um, um, definition I've, I've shared with you earlier on? Continuous self-reflection and recognizing the impacts of power and privilege. It emphasizes building trusting relationships, using culturally relevant theories, and prioritizing stakeholder well being. Thanks, Eva. Just a, one more minute. Good. So, CRE is a holistic framework um, that is, it, uh, to quote Professor um, Rodney Hobson, it's a theoretical framework, conceptual and inherently political. It is a, um, when you think about responsive evaluation, so we've defined culture, and then when you think about responsive, that term was actually coined by Robert Stake, and it fundamentally means to attend substantially, substantively and politically to issues of culture and minoritization. So when we're using artificial intelligence, evaluators need to put their blinkers on and understand the politics behind the purpose of the evaluation and the power differentials that are at play for any minoritized group, not, not just ethnically and raci racially diverse group. Um, evaluation, as you know well, refers to the determination of the merit and worth of a program or project. So what this means in AI is that an, an, a, a culturally responsive AI evaluation fully takes into account the culture of the program that is being evaluated, as well as the needs and cultural parameters of those being served relative to the implementation of a program and its outcomes. Culturally responsive evaluation pays particular attention to groups that have been historically marginalized, seeking to bring balance and equity into the evaluation process. Great, thank you very much, Eva. Um, great conversation starter for this. Um, I'll head over to the next question to Jory Hall. Um, why is it important to include design, implementation and equity criteria for artificial intelligence? 
Yes, thank you. And Eva, thank you so much for that thorough explanation of um, culture and culturally responsive evaluation. I think that provides a good foundation to build on. So Eva kind of outlined a lot of the goals of culturally responsive evaluation. And I just want to go back and say, from my perspective, building on what Eva said, CRE, I call culturally responsive evaluation, CRE for short, has goals such as centering the community and its cultural context. As Eva said, it's about engaging power dynamics um, because all of these things that CRE centers bleeds through all phases of the evaluation. It bleeds through phases of planning, preparation, developing the evaluation questions, collecting, analyzing data and the dissemination phase, for example. So from a CRE perspective then, this means that AI needs to be in service of the culturally responsive evaluation goals in service of centering communities and their cultural context, in service of inclusion, diversity, and all of those things. So the question then becomes to me, how can evaluators use AI to be in service to CRE goals? I think Ethan, Ethan Mullock's um, principles might be helpful to use as criteria in this way. Mullock is an academic who studies innovation. I do not. Um, Mullock is at the Wharton School um, in the, at the University of Pennsylvania. And some of you may have already read his book, Co-Intelligence, Living and Working with AI. And Morton, um, Moloch has four principles that I think are really helpful criteria that evaluators might be able to use when thinking about AI and its relevancy to evaluation. So the first principle that Moloch presents is principle one, always invite AI to the table. By that, he means that AI should help you to do the things that you're already doing to conduct an evaluation anyway. Understanding, of course, the legal and ethical issues. Um, Laurie Crawford, who presented earlier in a session, said something related to this principle when they encouraged us to practice, practice, practice prompts. So as we learned in previous um, sessions here, AI tools, there are so many, they're plentiful. I have personal experience with ChatGPT, so I'll stick to that because that's what I know. So the principle is to experiment. I think we as evaluators need to do that. So far, I have used ChatGPT as my personal editor. I think that practicing using it has helped me to get unstuck in my writing and getting out of my own head. As a culturally responsive evaluator, I think the implementation of the design needs to produce actionable information. That is important from a CRE perspective. I can see the potential of AI to help me work with communities to enhance our collective decision-making, not making decisions for communities. So for, uh, for example, I could ask AI to consider things um, when making a particular decision. It might offer considerations that I haven't even thought about. And as noted by the other um, presenters, AI can assist with co-constructing evaluation questions, data analysis, reporting, so on and so forth. It can even generate culturally responsive um, images when we disseminate to particular audiences, those kinds of things. So the point is for now, you want to invite AI to the table as an assistant, but nothing more. It can be conceivably used for all phases of the evaluation, but as we know, there are no rule books on how to use AI. So experimentation is key for evaluators, I think. Principle two from Mullock's book talks about being the human in the loop. Here, Mullock is, um, suggesting that AI does work best with humans. As of now, you need to be the human in the loop. You need to be the evaluator. This phrase is coming from early days of computing and it's suggesting that we have to incorporate human judgment. Evaluator judgment and expertise is absolutely necessary. AI is not ethical. It does not know right from wrong. It doesn't know anything. So because it's not particularly ethical, you have to be there to make sure that what the outputs present to you are correct. 
from a culturally responsive e evaluation perspective, this means that because equity is so important, you have to always check for hallucinations to make sure that the output aligns with equity goals of that particular um, community and is reflective of their values. Principle three has to do with treat AI like a person, but you need to tell it what kind of person it is. And I know this goes against thinking about AI as a human, but a lot of folks have been asking, because I heard them in previous sessions talk about, well, what are some tricks and things that we can use with prompts? And one of the things that Moloch suggests to do is give AI a persona. So from my perspective, if I'm a culturally responsive evaluator, I would tell AI, for as a prompt, I might say something like, act like a culturally responsive evaluator and suggest an evaluation design that might be responsive to Black communities living in Chicago, for example, given these following contextual factors, X, Y, and Z. So Moloch's point is here is, Yes, we don't want to think of AI as a person because that's very seductive and that could lead us down a slippery slope. But giving AI a persona, it could be your friend. You could pretend that it is a critic, a storyteller, might be really useful in getting the type of response that you really want in terms of those very specific um, outputs that we might be looking for. The last principle that I share with you that might be helpful to think about criteria when using AI in the context of evaluation that Moloch suggests is assume this is the worst AI you will ever use. So as was noted in the previous session, um, AI, we know we can do all kinds of things and there's more than one type of AI. I'm most familiar with the chat-based AI, as I said, um, chat GPT, but we know there are other kinds that can create documents, images, and sound. And it sounds awful great and fancy as it is today. However, even though as great as AI might seem to us today, Mullick notes that these are the worst AI technologies that we will ever use because guess what? It's only going to get better. It's only going to get more enhanced. And because of that, we can safely assume that the world, including the field of evaluation, will be even more transformed. And so because of that, again, we need to be attentive. So I think his principles can serve as criteria when we think about evaluation, and particularly in my case, as a culturally responsive evaluator, how to be more responsive. Admittedly, I gave a surface level uh, description of the principles. If you want to learn more in detail, I suggest you read the book. Um, I think the book is a very helpful. It helped my thinking. And I don't uh, study innovation, but it was very helpful as a person interested in these ideas and concerned to read about these things. And these principles, again, because of how things are advancing so quickly, they may only be relevant for a limited time, but I do hope you find the principles that I just shared, the four principles, useful criteria when thinking about applying AI in the context of evaluation. Thank you very much, Jory. I'll, I'll just head over to the rest of the panel to see whether, um, given Eva and, and Jory's um, really great comments to date, whether there are any other perspectives that, that Greg or Rula would like to share. I guess one of the things that I, I would say, um, and and I, I should preface my remarks by feeling today that one, I'm anything but an expert in AI. And I think even on Christie's survey yesterday, there wasn't a, 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 a category which uh, showed the, the low level of knowledge I have. And, and I'm surrounded by people who are experts in um, um, uh, in, in, in the, the topics that we're talking about. So I'm um, feeling privileged being here and I'm coming very much at this as an evaluation practitioner and, and someone who um, is learning um, and, and have learned an enormous amount already in these, in these sessions. But one of the things that strikes me about the concept of culturally responsive evaluation is also thinking about yourself as the evaluator and the culture that you bring to it. And, 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 and in the broad sense that Eva um, suggested not just from necessarily from um, the ethnic or ancestry context, but your own training, upbringing, and the like. And uh, for example, I I uh, was trained in psychology originally, 
went to psychology as a 17 year old and went into a very uni very particular brand of uh, psychology. So behavioral, rats and stats, science, you know, so-called scientific method, very technocratic, um, you know, logical positivist approach. And I didn't know that I, that was what I'd entered. I'd been, I was in that frame without knowing that there were a large, a lot of other frames, which over time I've sort of accommodated, but I'm still bound by some of that initial training. And I think one of the, seems to me, one of the aspects of a being at least culturally sensitive um, if that's the right term about doing evaluation, is acknowledging that you're, you bring your own baggage. You know, you have your own cultural um, aspects to um, the way the way we do the work, and I might talk a bit more about that in a little while. If I may add, oh, kia ora, everyone. Thank so, you. just so we comment on that, uh, from what I have seen in the literature, AI focuses on the processes. Uh, the implementation, the criteria, uh, AI probably is less interested or probably have no interest in the human behind that, whether that's the subject of the evaluation itself or the outcome, the focus is on the process. So engage AI as it can in a fair process, but you have to be in control of what goes in and what goes out. And... Um, this will require for years to come the evaluators to engage with the AI developers in order to perfect that process. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rula. And any other comments, Eva or Jory, that you'd like to throw in before I ask the next question? Great, okay, thank you. Uh, so next question is for Greg. Uh, so the impact of AI, what is the impact of AI on the cultural responsiveness of the outcomes of evaluation? Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, in thinking about this question, I, I actually, I, I guess I stripped back to think about going back a step back um, around evaluation per se. And and I should also note that when we, as Jory, I think has already said, you know, when we talk about AI and in the context of evaluation, we're talking about a huge range of things. And um, one of my colleagues, who I think Aram, Aram Rashid, who'll be on the panel tomorrow with Festival, um, but she gave me this um, useful classification, if you like, of uh, potential AI tools for use in evaluation. And it could be around admin, as simple things as, you know, getting your contracts, invoicing, sending emails and the like, and then there is the, um, the research and data collection aspects, and then there's the analysis and synthesis. And so the comments, I think there's you know, little doubt that in the administrative side, we can get enormous efficiencies and benefits from AI, and we can in the other ones, but there are also more risks associated with the um, uh, data collection and data analysis and synthesis tasks. So, but I'll concentrate more on those two. Um, I think going back to some of Eva's comments, um, evaluation, as we all know, is in, inherently a political activity. You know, sometimes dressed up as a technical or a scientific activity, but, but, but questions about what's being evaluated, why evaluation is being commissioned, the questions that are being asked in evaluation, how the data are collected, who does it, are all inherently political questions which go to power and balances and uh, distribution of power and information and the like. Um, and I learned this very early in my evaluation uh, career. So one of my first ever evaluations, which it may not have been called that way back um, um, when I was very young and very naive, was looking, and just very briefly, it involved looking at, I was working with community mental health services, and we looked at all the records of people who'd recently been discharged from a psychiatric hospital in the area and saw, and to see what proportion had actually been referred to the community mental health services in the area. And there was an expectation that people upon discharge would go to get picked up by the community mental health services. Um, what we found was, or what I found was zero. There had actually been no referrals. And I stupidly and naively uh, presented this information back to the two teams, who I'm sure you're not surprised, uh, received that information with a mixture of hostility, defensiveness, anger, um, and contempt toward, towards me as this, you know, young smart ass. Um, and so why did that happen? Well, why it happened was I did a very poor piece of work. Um, I walked in with my own set of assumptions, drawing a bit on what I'd come to say a bit earlier. Um, I used data collection techniques. I didn't involve 
um, the people in, who were the evaluants. And I, have, I don't think recently come across that term again after a long time not using it. It's a, it, it, it's almost they are the subjects, which in itself is, is, is of the evaluation. But people working in those services weren't involved. They had no knowledge of even doing this piece of work, um, much less uh, people who were in the hospitals and being discharged. So um, a little surprised that I got the sort of reaction I, uh, I did. Um, so what has all of that got to do with artificial in intelligence, you might ask? And the quick answer is everything and nothing. In a sense, this is not an that was a there was no artificial intelligence involved in there at all. AI was absent from here. So what if we move forward and say I'm doing this? Well, administratively, this would have been a much simpler piece of work. Uh, the data matching uh, could have occurred. Um, the administration of the project could have been uh, done a lot quicker. However, if I still adopted the same methods that I did then and the same general approach, I would still be in the same boat. There would and the result would have been the same. So the, the hardly, and in some ways, what could have compounded that is the fact that, as uh, Christy was saying yesterday, in contrast with auto, auto, automated decision-making tools, which have built in where you can actually explore the assumptions on the, under which those decisions are made around whether you should get this insurance policy or not, in a lot of the AI tools that we're using, we don't have ex access to that black box. So we don't know how it is what literature it's reviewing and coming up with a meta-analysis of um, referrals from psych to hospitals to uh, to uh, community mental health services, et cetera, et cetera. So we could even be um, compounding some of the problems that I mentioned and eroding trust, um, a point that Ruler will, will speak to um, shortly. So my not very revelatory conclusion, and remember I'm positioning myself here as someone who is a uh, 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 learning um, along the way. And, and, and the big lesson I've got, which Jari has again reinforced today, is let's get in there and get our hands dirty and try things. But my non-revelatory conclusion is that AI uh, can be a force for good or bad. And we can actually um, use it to entrench power imbalances or reinforce those, or we can use it as a tool for empowerment and democratization and engagement um, and in some ways, I guess that mirrors the experience with the, the internet when we all saw the potential for it to do lots of good, which it's done, but also the potential has clearly evolved for it to do lots of harm, which it, which it clearly has done as well. Thank you, Greg, and, and a lot of appreciation in the chat about uh, sharing some of those lessons and those opportunities for growth as well. So thank you for that. Um, I'll throw it over to the rest of the panel. Um, keen to hear any experiences that you've had with AI and how that's impacted the cultural responsiveness of the outcomes of evaluations that you've been involved in. I can, I mean, I, I actually haven't really used it as um, to conduct a, a full evaluation, but I've used it to generate some kind of synthesis. So I can't really answer that question. But I'd like to say to Greg, if you don't mind, about um, the example, the story that you shared with us about when you were younger, Greg. I think oftentimes, just, just to sort of change the, 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 the stream for a second, I, I think that oftentimes what happens is that we, we, we don't really realize that we are doing a culturally responsive evaluation. We already probably, some of us are already doing culturally responsive, but we're not phrasing it in that way. So this is what I keep trying to re-emphasize that it's, it's for all of us to do. So, so culturally responsive evaluation is an activist type of um, approach, which you can apply, like Jory said, in AI. Um, I think in your example, Greg, you know, you said that the two um, organizations that was supposed to support the, um, the patient didn't talk to each other. That's a culture in and of itself. So in the report that you actually write, you know, what we're saying is whether you generate the information from the AI or whether you do it with non-AI, what you're trying to do is to break down those structural organizational barriers in like um, on behalf of that patient who's stuck in the middle of the system, if that makes sense. So, um, but no, um, Laura, I haven't actually um, used it in a comprehensive way. I don't know about you, Jory. Have you? 
I'm beginning to use it in some phases in terms of thinking about, so um, I'm searching for, I, I teach evaluation theory um, just to be transparent. And I teach a lot of other courses too. And so because theory is so important to the work that I do, and there's um, CRE is open to many different kinds of culturally uh, appropriate theories, depending on the group that you're working with. The short version is AI helped me think about what theory might be most appropriate. It has helped me think about questions for um, protocols that I'm using, like for focus groups, for example, things of that nature. And so with each day that passes, I'm going through the phases slowly but surely. And so I have yet to discover all the different ways, but I'm excited about it, especially um, for, I, I would like to go into more arts-based evaluation. And so the images that AI can create um, seem very attractive to me in terms of telling AI to generate something that would be very specific to a community or to a group or to, to bring some more life, if you will, to my reporting or ways of sharing information, if you will. And so I'm excited about the potential that it has and, and cautious. So I'm cautiously optimistic, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's probably a good space to be in. Uh, thank you for those thoughts. Um, Rula, I'll hand over to you now. Um, how and should evaluation and AI incorporate considerations of trust and trustworthiness? Thank you, Laura. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Um, I acknowledge our mana whenua, kaitaho, where I stand here in Otupoti, Dunedin. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I think I picked a very niche uh, area about trust and trustworthiness in evaluation. She was quite excited. And for that exercise, I had to go and do some literature review and um, also maybe interrogate Chad GBT and see what they say about that because my views were completely um, uh, different. So let's delve in. So in evaluation, trust and trustworthiness are crucial concepts that impact the credibility, reliability, and integrity of the evaluation process and its outcomes. Now, before we delve into the considerations around how trust and trustworthiness relate to the evaluation and its outcomes, uh, especially when evaluating uh, interventions in different cultures and diverse communities, uh, let's check how they are typically understood. And allow me to put here the hat of the community impacted by the evaluation uh, and uh, the intervention. So trust, trust in evaluation refers to confidence the stakeholders may have in three components. Um, and I put them in order of the evaluator, the evaluation process itself, and the results uh, produced. Now, I've asked ChatGBT about trust in the evaluation process. Give me a very mechanical uh, response. It means that it's conducted fairly, accurately, transparently, and that the findings and conclusions are valid and useful. So these are the key words that the machine spit out. And trust is essential for stakeholders to accept and act upon the evaluation findings and recommendations. Now, from where I come from, Trust starts with the evaluators themselves. They are the key to the entire process. So before considering faith in the process itself, it is a human connection and it's relational. As a stakeholder impacted by the outcome of evaluation, how much do I know the evaluator? How much are they invested in the relationships? How close are they to my community that what is their intention in the evaluation from the start, aside from you know, getting paid um, for, the, for, the, for the work, for the mahi? Do they understand how interventions can alienate some participants and include others? So for me, trust involves believing that the evaluators will devise a process that preserves the mana of the people, that is their sovereignty and agency during the process. Maintaining respect, guarding the information related to them, and closing the loop of feedback to reach a full circle that involves the stakeholders all the way. That's where trust can be um, maintained 
and that's also where trust can be eroded while using a machine. And trust also involves being assured that the outcome is more focused on mitigating harm, especially for, for vulnerable communities and less about the concepts of objectivity in evaluation. The other concept that I've interrogated is the trustworthiness. And that in evaluation refers to the characteristics and practices um, that make an evaluation credible and reliable. Again, this is a concept that relies on an objective process um, in an increasingly and uh, definitely a human subjective uh, world. Uh, there are four dimensions that define trustworthiness, and I'll name them here, and we can go back and uh, discuss further. So for you in evaluation, that's the credibility, the dependability, the validity, and the transparency of the project or the process. Now, in an ideal world, ensuring trust and trustworthiness in evaluation requires care careful attention to the methodological rigor ethical conduct, the stakeholder engagement, and I cannot emphasize that enough, and how you communicate those findings. Evaluators must establish and maintain that credibility by adhering to professional standards and best practices, being transparent about their methods and limitations, and engaging stakeholders. Now, given that AI is increasingly incorporated in several domains and partially doing the work of the evaluators. How much trust can be uh, can the stakeholders have in a system built on algorithms? And how much of that algorithm did not inherit biases from our day-to-day -day cultural misconceptions about the other? I am personally veering towards thinking that using AI can potentially make evaluation less trustworthy due to the inherent biases present in both the data used to train the AI uh, models and also the algorithms um, behind, behind that. And here is how. So there are a few points that I will speak to quite briefly. The biased uh, data. So the AI systems will learn from our historical data, what we have been putting on the internet and in our research and every resource that it has made available in modeling how AI can do um, the work for us. So that would reflect a lot of societal biases, inequalities. So one example, if the historical hiring data shows bias against a certain uh, demographic or ethnic group, such biases can be perpetuated in AI-powered hiring systems, leading to unfair outcomes. And you can think of so many examples similar to that. Now, evaluators need to critically assess whether the training data used in the AI models is representative and unbiased and definitely inclusive of who we are as a collective. On this note, I find that if AI to become part of evaluation, and it will come become part of evaluation, evaluators must work closely now with AI developers to eliminate the inherent uh, threat. So this might be a shift in what evaluators can do. Um, instead of evaluating in the traditional methods, traditional ways, they could also become trainers and engaged in uh, developing these uh, AI uh, methods. And you can see from where I come from, we're not here debating whether AI will become part of the process or not. It will. The, the question is how and how we can make it useful for us. The other um, key points is the algorithm, uh, algorithmic um, bias. So those can definitely amplify and perpetuate biases present in the data they are trained on. And they can occur due to various factors, such as the design itself, the feature, the selection, and so on and so forth. Um, another point that uh, Greg mentioned earlier is the black box nature, which simply is the model behind uh, the decision-making process. They are not transparent or easily interpreted 
uh, by humans. So if I am as an evaluator cannot uh, do not understand uh, the process behind how the outcome um, has resulted, how am I going to um, explain that to the stakeholder? So there's a lack of transparency here. It can erode trust in the evaluation outcome. And as stakeholders may not uh, understand how the AI system arrive at their decisions, we as evaluators may not also be able to explain that, which also will erode the trustworthiness in us as the face of the uh, the process. And the last Just point- a minute. Uh, Yes, and the last point is the feedback uh, loop. And I cannot stress that enough. We try in our day-to-day -day jobs outside of evaluation to always close the loop. So there are biases present in AI systems that can create a feedback uh, loop where biased outcomes perpetuate existing inequalities. Um, on that note, I might say that evaluators need to examine whether AI systems mitigate or exacerbate um, existing biases and assess their implications all the way. So there needs to be a human element. Now, if I may conclude, the silver lining for all of this, and I veered onto the risk side of things, is that this entire exercise of engaging AI in evaluation, if it's done in a in an authentic way, it could be a genuine opportunity to fix a broken system. So if we can correctly and genuinely feed in the machine um, concepts and values that we aspire to, we might uh, get some help from the machine to um, produce results that are accepted and welcomed by all. Thank, Thank you. you um, did other panel members want to comment on on that question as well? To looking at the uh, the role of trust and trustworthiness in AI. I, I could guess I just I, I think that you know the framework and those three uh, aspects there are really, really useful to think about. And again, it makes me reflect reflect on broader evaluation practices as much as it does around um, the use of of AI in evaluation. Um, my experience sadly has been though, is that if we are talking about an inherently political activity evaluation and where we may be giving voice to those who don't have a voice and challenging power structures or the allocation of resources or whatever, inevitably there will be some potential losers um, who are previously the winners. And my experience has been they're often not, they don't see you as trustworthy as a result of that. They don't, it does happen occasionally, but quite often they don't say, well, this was a really trustworthy and a very good process. Um, and even though I'm unhappy with the outcome, um, I accept that it was a good process. Often I will then say, well, sorry, the process was bad because it didn't leave the outcome I wanted. Um, and I guess that I, 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 it's a bit of the nature of evaluation activity and certainly, again, could be compounded or mitigated by the use of AI. I just wanted to quickly add something that it was quite striking, the the, the difference between Rula, what you what chat GPT um it bring, drives back the whole point that there isn't a human, you know, it really lacked a it's technical, isn't it? Pulls together some buzzwords. Um, but then, you know, the way that you reflect it, and, and like you said, you, you got it from it from literature as well. You can see the difference, the, the human element that comes into it. But I think what's exciting um, that Jory said is that we're only at the beginning of it. And the more we, um, I don't know about you, when I'm using, um, sometimes I layer, so it'll spit something out, chat GPT will spit something out, I'll then add to it and then input it back in. And I'm feeding the AI itself, right? So in that way, that's an activist approach, really, because we're actually giving it more information to strengthen its definition of what um, trust looks like. So that's one way to kind of drive some of the change, I think. Laura, I don't know how, how are we on time? Do I have a chance to respond or should I just hold? Oh, do yes, please. Yes, please respond. 
Yeah. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> um, sure. Thank you. Just wanted to be sure. So I just think I wanted to supplement what Rula said. I totally agree with all the points and thank you for such a thorough um, response. And the thing that I was thinking a lot about is I actually am working on a piece, a paper on trustworthiness. And it strikes me that given the political climate as an academic and an evaluator, I'm often pressured to show trustworthiness in my work, right? And so what ends up happening, what can happen as other people have argued, not just myself, is that that political pressure to publish or perish, um, for example, in my field, pushes me to think about trustworthiness as a procedure. I have to show triangulation, member checking, these kinds of things versus relationships. And so what can happen to evaluators, I think, too, is that we take out all the messiness of how trustworthiness is established through relationships, as you were saying, Rula, and we just really focus on the procedures and we have this nice, neat, tidy evaluation report or article that doesn't really reveal all the messiness and complexity underneath. And I think that that's a very problematic thing. And what um, people that I work with am calling for, and I think what AI will demand of us as evaluators is to reimagine how we think about trustworthiness and how we disclose how we have used AI in the context of the evaluation. And that's a nod to some of the comments that I see in the chat here about should we mandate that evaluators disclose how they use um, AI tools, products, et cetera, in the process of evaluation. I would agree with that. And someone else, I just want to acknowledge the comment about they were really critically thinking through how AI can help with CRE work and can it be used as a tool to jumpstart our thinking about these issues, about things to investigate. And I, I would agree with that with caution, right? Um, certainly it could be used as a great tool to get us thinking about issues around trustworthiness and things of the like. But I do think that um, given where we are, we're gonna have to reimagine the consent process, working with people, how to engage collabor collaboratively, excuse me, with communities, um, how to do all sorts of things. So I just wanted to throw that out there, Laura. Thank you for allowing me just a little bit of space to share those thoughts. Thank you, Jory. No, I think that's a really important point. And, and I think the the comment was focusing, at least the way I interpreted it, on the client and evaluation kind of relationship. But I think there's another element mm. there in bringing in um, all the other stakeholders that are involved in the evaluation, people that you are collecting data with and, and from, um, to bring them into the process and making sure that, as you said, that they have consented to how the information will be used. Um, did did you or did any other panel members have any comments on bringing others into that process as well, um, particularly when we're still in the relatively early stages of AI and there's a bit of a um, sometimes a knowledge gap as to what AI is and what it does and so acknowledging that there's a need for bringing people along that journey. If I may, uh, just to reiterate probably a, a point I've alluded to, because I have been watching this, there are a lot of jobs advertised like on LinkedIn for people to go and test models of using AI in different fields and evaluation will not be immune to that. And from working with um, small organizations here in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, can see that for many in their five-year strategic plan or seven-year um, strategic plan, people have accepted the fact that AI will be here in five, seven years in a dominating what we do, probably eliminating some of the jobs or changing the nature we do some of those jobs. So again, it's not a matter of whether it's going to happen or not, but what the, our best opportunity starting yesterday and our second uh, next best opportunity starting today to engage in um, um, remodeling and impacting the AI. So even if we don't have the technical um, expertise to do the AI modeling themselves, we need to offer our expertise as evaluators to enga engage and ensure that all of these biases and um, risks that we, we have or worries about uh, AI will be um, eliminated. And again, it's an ongoing process. Even if AI becomes part of it, 
I think that uh, monitoring and evaluating the performance of AI itself over time to the and mitigate biases will be uh, crucial. So part of our evaluation will be evaluating how we are <laughs> uh, ref reframing uh, the engagement of AI and, and other evaluation projects. So uh, it's an ongoing process and I encourage myself and others to just go for it and um, not leave it for others to do it, but become part of it. especially to maintain um, cultural competency and culturally responsive evaluation. Thank you. Go ahead, Jory. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add or Greg? I'm, I'm fine to move forward, Laura. Uh, uh, Greg, do you have something to share? I, look, I've just reinforced the point Rula made there about the need, um, seems ironic to say this, but as evaluators, I think we need to be evaluating the um, the use of AI tools and whether, uh, as to all the, the, the classic characteristics, reliability, validity, cultural responsiveness, et cetera, et cetera, and not adopt them uncritically, which would be just bad evaluation practice anyhow. And there's a really interesting comment in the chat on that point as well about how important our roles are as evaluators and making sure that we do critically consider the information that we have. Um, I'm keen to hear the panel's perspectives on how we know when we're being successful in that role. How do we know that we are critically considering and being culturally responsive in the evaluations that we conduct? In jump. And I think I mean, it, 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 when we reach saturation and alignment with the stakeholders, so when you take the output from the actual AI and then take it to the people and say, does it reflect your reality? I think that's that's one way of judging success. Um, I've just had a thought that's come out of my mind. So I'll, I'll brew that one for a minute and jump back in in a second. I had another one, but maybe somebody else wants to add something. Eva, I agree with you. It's definitely while closing closing the loop because the ultimate goal is to serve the community. We're not doing the evaluation for the sake of evaluation. It's for learning, for lessons learned, for improving our processes. Um, but if our processes are causing harm or bringing people to the middle and pushing others and alienating them, um, we will only know when we get the feedback from the impacted uh, or the evaluation land what do you call it Craig everybody wants, wants yeah uh yeah it's definitely it, there and we well, may I or may I'll... not reach oh, that sorry, stage Rula. yeah go ahead no no I, I just said no we may or may we may not <laughs> reach that stage of um knowing that yeah we've succeeded go ahead that's thank what you. I was gonna say really thank no. you for providing that segue actually I was just going to say that um I have failed at culturally responsive evaluation in major ways. And I think it's um, kind of a false advertisement to assume that it will all be perfect if you just follow this particular recipe and work collaboratively with, with people. Um, there are a lot of politics that get in the way in terms of why an evaluation may go south, even when you put forth your best efforts to be culturally responsive, asking participants, saturation, all of these things. And I wrote about the piece because I think that's something important for us to keep in mind, um, that these things that we talk about are aspirational, um, equity, um, inclusion, diversity, these things are the things that we strive for, recognizing that we're all human. The other thing I would like to say kind of provocatively, just to stir the pot uh, a bit, is to say that AI is getting a bad rap, I know, because of all the biases that it, it's trained on, and rightly so. But also, I just think that it's interesting, to me anyway, that in my limited thinking on this, like, Greg, I'm not an expert, but I don't think AI necessarily it's faster, which is dangerous, as someone noted in the, in the chat, in terms of the biases that it can present to us very confidently. But I don't think, it's not like humans aren't biased. <laughs> like we're acting, I feel like in a way we're acting as if 
when we work with humans, we're working with perfect people who are not biased, right? And so, and the AI is presenting all of this bias. I know that we don't mean it that way, but it it, it can sound that that way. And I'm 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 poking a little bit, but just to remind us that um, the very people that we work with, communities evaluators, we're, we're all holding, as Greg said, these bag this baggage. And um, from a qualitative research perspective, I teach courses on that too. I would just kindly like to say our biases can be used productively and actually they can be helpful in some ways. Um, I am biased. I see things differently and, and also that can be helpful. So I just wanted to say that too. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Jory, very much. Um, it's been a very interesting discussion. In the last minute or so, were there any final comments from the rest of the panel? I like uh, Rula's comment there. Uh, AI is a, an organised mirror of us. I think that's cool. <laughs> no, of some of us, Rula, of some of us. <laughs> <laughs> the collective us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, with that, we'll draw this session to a close and, and let um, people uh, get back to their days or stay on for the next session, which I strongly encourage you to do. Before we leave, thank you very much to all of our panel, uh, Jory Hall, Eva Sala, Rula Tahama and Greg Masters. Because Leesk um, has been working in the ICT domain for over 30 years and in ICT procurement for over 20 He's been involved in helping customers understand and implement every major business technology innovation we have come to rely on, including office automation, document and records management, enterprise resource planning, web, energy markets, immunogenetics, information and cybersecurity, and artificial intelligence. I'm very proud that I said all of those things without stumbling. <laughs> he enjoys working with customers to understand their needs and transform business operations using ICT as an enabler. And today, Nicholas is going to speak to us about the organizational application of AI, including uh, challenges, strengths, and opportunities. Over to you, Nicholas. Thanks, Molly. Uh, can I just get a quick thumbs up? People can hear me okay? Awesome. Uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs> um, couple of caveats. Uh, I've got a lot of content in here and I'm not going to necessarily be able to get to it all, so I will move quite quickly. But the idea is that um, hopefully I will be able to share the slide deck that will give you uh, it will give you hopefully enough information that you can uh, use it as a checklist. If I'm still quiet, let me know. I'm on my headset, but if that's not working, I'll, I'll use my uh, office mic. Um, I've left you a, uh, a uh, QR code here. It's a great video to watch if you want to see where uh, AI might be going. This is the combination of um, Figure One's robotics and OpenAI demonstrating speech-to-speech -speech reasoning and environmental uh, awareness. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about really these five kind of topics, topic areas, and then hopefully have some room for a, a bit of QA at the end. I suppose the idea with the topic around organizational application of AI is, is just uh, talking a little bit about how do we go from having you know, a few people in the office, in your organization who fiddle around with open AI uh, or chat GPT or something else. Uh, you all know who you are. Um, but how do we take that further to becoming something that's actually embedded in an organization, something that has um, you know corporate uh, enterprise level um, uh, coverage and uh, and uh, is integrated into business processes and activities that we undertake. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a primer, talk a bit about understanding AI capabilities, uh, talk about some challenges and opportunities, and then cover off uh, some of the considerations that you might uh, want to think about when moving into your enterprise. And then if there's time at the end, there's a few examples that we can um, talk to. So starting off uh, just a little bit about artificial intelligence, you know, what is it even? Um, this is quite a confusing topic, I think. Uh, and part of that has to do with the fact that this is a dynamic uh, and developing environment. Um, you know, literally from the point in time when I started writing this uh, presentation three, four weeks ago or so, stuff changed. And Sorry, <laughs> changed my presentation. 
Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you really quickly. It does sound like people are having a bit of trouble with the audio. So maybe if you could change, that would be awesome. Is that any better? That's way better. That's amazing. Thank you. All right. Uh, the AirPods are going away. <laughs> <clears throat> so artificial intelligence is 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 changing, you know, as we sit here, um, and it, it it changed, you know, the sort of capabilities it had and that, that were in the public domain changed just in the three weeks that I spent um, since I was asked to speak at this um, conference. So, what is AI? It's really an umbrella term for a whole family of tools, techniques, models, methods um, designed to simulate behaviors that are considered intelligent. Um, and as a practitioner, I guess one thing I would say is there's actually no intelligence in there. So uh, don't let that bit kind of scare you in any way. Um, and in trying to find yeah, a more formal kind of definition, there are a few floating around, but the one that I, I felt um, had the most thought behind it was the definition from the OA OECD. Um, and I think they demonstrate their in intensity of thinking about this problem uh, by the fact that this definition itself, I could see from their papers, had changed, you know, five or six times over the last few years as they're trying to really come to grips with what the heck this thing is. Um, but some of the key points there are sort of highlighted, and that is it's a machine-based system. It infers things from the inputs it receives. It generates predictions, content recommendations or generations that can influence physical or virtual environments. And I think that's kind of really important. Um, and that's one of the areas that it, it differs from other types of systems. And there are lots of different AI systems that operate at all sorts of different levels of autonomy and, adap and adaptiveness. Um, I thought it was useful. One of the things I've been looking for for a while is a bit of a model that kind of says, how do I think about the whole domain of artificial intelligence? Um, because people talk about deep learning and they talk about neural networks and they talk about machine learning and they talk about all these different terms. And, and I didn't really find a strong way to be able to structure those to say, this is the whole world of AI. It all fits in here somewhere and here's how it kind of breaks down a bit. Um, but here's a model that I adopted from some MIT research that I think is, is not a bad starting point. Uh, and it really splits the whole world into two domains, the symbolic approach and the statistical approach. Um, <clears throat> it would be my experience that the symbolic approach has been around for a long time, um, and we might not have previously called it AI. And even now, we probably might not call some of those techniques AI. We might say, oh, they're very basic, you know, techniques, but this gives us a way of kind of framing that whole thing. What's really interesting, though, is all the stuff on the right, the statistical approaches, the machine learning, the neural networks, the deep neural networks, the large language models, all of that kind of stuff. That's where everything's happening right now. Um, and some examples here on the symbolic approach side, we have things like expert systems and decision trees and semantics um, and planning and scheduling type models. Um, Expert systems are, are, for example, the sort of thing that someone on the on a call center might step through to to get you a home loan. You know that the system is guiding you through all the processes and making sure you don't forget what needs to come next, and helping you make decisions so that every customer gets treated, you know, uh, equally and in this and in a sufficiently rigorous manner. And that sort of stuff's been around. Like even I remember probably a project I I worked on in 1991. Um, at the Australian Bureau of Statistics, we were dealing with expert systems. So it's been around for a long time. And then there's all this uh, crazy new stuff that's happening on the right-hand side, natural language processing, generative systems, um, predictive recommendations, all that sort of thing. And I suppose I tried to sort of go like, what is the really big difference between these two domains in a really simple sense? And I, I came up with these two ideas. And that is really on the symbolic side, it's, it's very model driven uh, and very procedurally driven. So, you know, things happen one thing after another. If you put the same things into a symbolic approach type process, you'll get the same sort of outcomes. Whereas on the statistical side, it's very data driven and it's based on probabilities. Um, so it gives you a probabilistic type of outcome and that can give you all sorts of different outcomes. Everyone will have noticed that if three different people ask, you know, an AI or a large language model, the same question, you don't all get the same answer exactly. Now, uh, 
I thought I'd just try and clear up a little bit about the mystery of like, how do you create an AI? Um, and I think this is really interesting, particularly interesting. I've used this in some other um, presentations, but I think this is particularly interesting for evaluators because as I thought through this again, in the context of what you do, I thought evaluators are just uniquely and specifically perhaps well positioned to deal with AI because you're always looking at how does it work? Why does it work? Is it doing what I want? All that sort of thing. And that is sort of somewhat inherent to the way that AI works. So just walking through it kind of reasonably quickly, uh, you need a whole lot of data. That, that's one of the key kind of inputs. You need to create it or collect it or synthesize it. <clears throat> um, and you need to use that uh, to create a subset or a set of data that you're going to use for training. And you might um, put that data into the AI and get it to do things. Then you'll check what it does. You'll correct it where it's right, where it's wrong, and then you'll reprocess that. So it kind of goes through this process where you're feeding the data into the AI model. You're then saying, no, no, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. Refeeding the, the corrections and the new data back in and you're cycling it around. And basically you're aiming to get to this point where uh, the AI is producing what you would be able to measure as the right sort of responses, you know, so and at that point you kind of know, you know, this AI is you know, doing what I wanted it to do. Um, and that's the validation process. So best practice here is that you're, you're testing it on an, potentially some of the data you created or collected right at the beginning, but data that the AI has never seen before. So you actually have sort of hived it away in the process so that you're then uh, testing it on, on scenarios, on data, on information it's never seen to make sure that it's actually still able to um, produce the outcome you want in a, in a brand new kind of situation. And often that validation will be done by different people um, or different teams uh, to, to, to make sure it's, it's really independent. And then you kind of move out of that training mode into the use use mode. Um, and at that point, you're tasking the, uh, the AI with things. You're providing it with um, input or prompts. Everyone's heard about prompt engineering. You're, you're providing prompts. You're looking at what the outcomes are. And then you're making further updates to it if it needs to extend its capability or do new things. And the idea out of that all is you get insights. And I think this is really important that there, to me, there's a really big difference between getting a bunch of insights out of an AI and then thinking about what to do with them versus perhaps what I what I kind of termed here, I'm terming here as end-to-end -end process um, AI, where not only are the insights coming out, but the AI is acting on those insights independently without human intervention. <clears throat> and that's, I would say, in the short term where bad things are going to happen. But so I want to talk a bit about understanding AI capability. Um, and I think this is really key kind of thing to understand. And that is what's so different about AI compared to other systems. And I tried to come up with some sort of simple analogy. And this is, this is my best shot. And that is that it works a bit like a car. Um, you, you've got an object that already exists, which would be your AI uh, engine. Um, so it's powered by an engine but you've got to feed it data and it's the feeding it of the data that cre that, that uh, gives the AI engine its capability. Um, you steer it when you're trying to actually use it by, by training it and by feeding it prompting information. Um, and it's best used in, in a context, in a specific context. You have a need, you have a context, you have a destination you want to get to, uh, and that's how you're then using that. And there's sort of two um, pictures there on the side. One of them's, you know, kind of a marble run, and that's the sort of deterministic type model where you every time you put a, a marble in there, it's going to follow the same track and pop out the bottom versus this the uh, the Galton ball, which people may have seen on the side here. You turn this thing upside down and all the beads go into the little reservoir at the top and you turn it back up the other, other way and every one of those beads will end up in a different place, but generally they're always going to create a similar kind of shape, which is a, you know, a normal distribution um, and that's sort of more of your probabilistic type approach, um, which is how you know, AIs come up with the right sort of answers without just sort of going off piste and, and being uh, being crazy, but they can provide you with all sorts of different nuances within that uh, broad framework. 
So what is AI kind of good at? And I guess what in, in the summary of the summary is it's good at dealing with large volumes of data, large uh, model and probabilistic spaces, a lot of scenario, you know, could do scenario modeling. Uh, it, it's proven itself as great at doing image and text generation, image and text processing. Um, <clears throat> it's used a lot for monitoring and reporting. So in, in the domain I work in, in the systems domain, uh, you know, AI uh, <clears throat> is showing incredible capability in, in its its ability to plow through you know, hundreds and thousands of rows of system error logs and things and generate uh yeah, insights. Oh, uh, this this hard disk over here is just about to fail because you know the, these are the really early warning signals. I'm seeing in this mass of data that the that's being um, processed within the data center, for example. Um, we've seen it's quite good at generating predictions or options. You know, not necessarily just developing an option and then actioning it, but providing people with good ideas. Um, lots of people who've had to go present at seminars like this would be like. Okay, this is what the uh, what the presenter is asking for. Throw it into an AI. Give me ten things I could talk about here, you know, and uh, and a good way to do some brainstorming with a virtual partner. Um, some of the things it's not so good at, and I would argue that is end to end automation. You know, tip data in one end and get I don't know robo debt letters flying out the other end. Not really a very good use. Um, Although RoboDebt gets talked about in the context of AI, I'm, I'm reasonably sure they didn't use any AI for that, but it's a good example. Um, <clears throat> not so good at generating precise outputs. So things like contracts or code, because a generative AI in particular is just guessing at what word might come next in a probabilistic manner. Um, a, a contract that's roughly right is, is bad. You know, contracts need to be precise, perfect. So do code, so does code. Uh, you know, code that's not perfect, won't compile, won't run, won't do what you want. Um, working on highly sensitive or classified data, I think can be a problem area because of the way that it's then learning from that data and, and uh, which can make it hard to control um, the distribution of it. And, and kind of jokingly, I'll put a line through this, human interaction and communications, I mean, uh, ChatGPT just launched 4.0 um, two weeks ago and it does a bunch of this stuff. So can it not do that? I don't know. I guess the jury's out a bit. Uh, it looks like it can do it. Is it useful? Is it uh, good or bad? I don't know. We'll, we'll yet to see, I suppose. Um, talking a bit about challenges and opportunities. So I'm not going to go through all the detail in here. This is perhaps something people can read up on uh, when the when the slide deck's available. But the challenges uh, are, are kind of the blue sections, and the and the the black notes are, are examples of that. But this is a developing industry. Um, you know, really, what we would consider to be, I guess, the modern um, phase of AI only started in 2015 um, <clears throat> when OpenAI. Kind of got together and they probably didn't really they didn't really achieve very much for the first six months to a year so you know you could even say that the real start was was later than that um and then here we are you know like less than 10 years later uh with uh you know all sorts of amazing things that the open ai chat gpt all these different bots can kind of do um if you're doing it at a big enough scale or on, on a complex enough task it's expensive um, you know, ChatGPT, they estimate costs $100 million to train and <clears throat> costs about $60 for every million tokens that it processes. So when you ask it a question, you know, it's costing some investor somewhere, uh, possibly not you at this point, but someone. When you think about it that way, it's kind of crazy that anything is available for free right now, but um, there's a gold rush on. So people are trying to claim their space. Um I caught the end of the the previous um, session, so there's obviously there's a lot of focus on bias. Um, you know, current iterations can amplify bias and they can promote discrimination depending on what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, and as people were saying, this is not like something that's that's kind of just come out of nowhere. The bots have been tra trained on, which is you know the last. 20 years of internet history, and that includes 
uh, an awful lot of uh, bias, discrimination and all that sort of stuff. Um, another challenge is the black box model, which is that it can be very difficult to understand what happens within the AI model to actually come up with a particular decision. There isn't that kind of traceability that we would have. So if you think about um, an expert system or a decision tree, you know, you can easily store data about every step that was taken in any given decision tree to come up with an outcome. And then if it turns out that you someone followed the process and you gave insurance to someone who's a terrible, terrible risk, you can go back and see how did that happen? Why did it go wrong? You can correct the model. It's all quite easy. But with a lot of these, um, particularly the deep the neural networks and deep neural networks, it's very difficult to actually understand exactly how the AI came to a particular decision. So tracing back, if it was, you know, just pour a bunch of financial data in one end and the AI tells you whether someone should get insurance or not, it says yes, it says no. You don't really know how it came to that conclusion. Um, there are ways of dealing with that, but it's very uh, complex and we're not that great at it right now. Um, fraud, I think everyone's read or heard about some kind of uh, fraud, fraudulent use of AI. Um, and there's sort of two aspects to that. One is just accelerating the speed at which fraudsters can actually perpetrate fraud right now. And the other, the other big category is uh, fraud that could never have been perpetuated previously, but now can because of AI. So things like, you know, uh, the ability to mimic someone's voice. So, hey, if you're using your voice to authenticate yourself with the ATO when you call them up, you know, how long is that going to last for? Um, because it's it's very vulnerable now uh, because of the capabilities of AI. And then data and security. There's a ton of data involved in this. There's all the training data. There's all the prompting data. There's all the outputs data. Um, and there's plenty of, plenty of examples of um, organizations that have um, put data into a uh, an AI and then had it turn up in other places that they weren't expecting. Sorry, just give me one sec. Someone's decided to make a smoothie in the kitchen. <clears throat> I'm sure you probably all hear that. Um, so thinking about opportunities for AI in evaluation, um, I think there's a few direct areas that it can work into. Uh, and these are the, the kind of four that I came up in, in QT with some of my evaluation um, uh, friends at work. I think there's also the opportunity to be using AI as an, as an oversight or a checking process over the top of, of evaluation. You know, we've run this process the same way we always ran it. What other insights are there? How could it be better? Where did we go wrong? Um, is it, it are our outcomes reliable? Um, and and that's not necessarily then, I guess, just creating you a direct outcome in terms of your evaluation, but it might be uh, giving you insights to your process or insights to your um, conclusions that that make you think differently about the process or the outcomes, or it might spot patterns and things that you just didn't see. Um, but things like thematic analysis. So, you know, we've got this ton of data. Tell me what the themes are here. Um, you know, and and so like we use this quite a lot uh, within our organization. If we do an, a, 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 um, an online um, facilitated workshop, people are virtual sticky noting all over the place. I can, I can now in our tool just select all of those um, sticky notes and say, AI, tell me what the five top themes are here or categorize these by the emotive content of those sticky notes, et cetera. Um, so that kind of stuff is, is really valuable. <clears throat> uh, literary reviews and summaries um, is fantastic. Uh, you know, just the ability to, to, if you've got large libraries of, of, professional materials to provide you with precedence information or summaries or uh, literature reviews that you can use, um, you know, during an evaluation. Um, lead indicator predictions. Again, this comes back to AI's, you know, really real strength in spotting patterns that we can't necessarily see. Um, I guess, you know, our, our historical approach to uh, to pattern analysis, uh, data analysis is, is you, you just try and cut, you know, the data five, 10, 20 different ways and see what you can see. Whereas AI, AI is a much more capable of 
<clears throat> um, of working through that content much more quickly. And then possibly intervention modeling. So looking at what sort of outcomes and interventions might be valuable from a given um, evaluation. I've got 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna skip on. Uh, considerations for organizational deployment. All right. So in thinking about this, I think there's a number of organizational foundations to go from a few people playing around with chat GPT to we've got AI embedded in, in business systems. Um, uh, and these are the, the top areas that I think are really important from having personal experience and also read a lot of uh, background information. So really understanding the principles behind what you're doing. So we're not just doing AI for AI's sake. What are we doing? Why are we going about it? How are we going to manage you know, fairness, transparency, accountability, protect against bias, all those sort of things. Um, legislative and regulatory environment. So for, for some businesses in some sectors of our economy, it's going to be very easy to implement AI. And for others, their legislative and regulatory environment is going to make it very hard. And we basically don't have any legislation or regulation that's been set up really uh, specifically to either uh, enable or, or protect against AI. So some people will find in their particular domain that maybe they can't use AI at all until there is further change in those regulations or, or laws to allow it. Um, policy, you really need to have a policy position around, you know, how you go about using AI. I mean, the real simple one is, do our policies even allow it at all? And you may find that they don't. Um, but going forward into the future, organisations are going to have to have specific policies and they're going to have to have other common organisational policies that are specifically tailored to uh, allow AI to occur in their environment in a way that is acceptable to the organisation, to its mission, to its values. Um, standards. You know, to make sure that AI is done right, done consistently, we need standards about how we train it, how we test it, how we use it, how we validate, and make sure it's doing the right thing. And you will have standards already, which probably don't talk specifically to AI, but may constrain or direct how AI should be applied. Um, <clears throat> Training is really important, and there's really kind of three layers to that. One is senior management, you know, they need to know enough to be able to make decisions about the principles, the policy, the governance arrangements, the standards. Um, but you also need technicians who are part of your business, who know what's going on and, and are appropriately trained. And then you need end users, the people who are going to be, you know, uh, utilising these tools. Um, they also need to have appropriate training. Um, so environmental factors that are required for a good AI deployment. The first one is picking an appropriate business case or use case. Um, there's no point in picking something that AI is not good at. There's no point in picking some situation to deploy it that you as a practitioner are not equipped to deal with. There's no point in picking a use case that your business is not equipped to deal with. And by that, I mean, you know, the, the broader um, infrastructure of your business. You need high quality data because you've got to train it, you've got to um, uh, test it, you've got to make sure it's doing the right thing. And the better the quality of your data, the, the more accurate your AI is going to be. Um, you really need to be looking at things that can be built incrementally. Like you can't go from, uh, I think AI is a good idea to, you know, uh, issuing traffic fines as your first uh, foray as an organisation into this. So... You need something that can start relatively small, that can be tested and validated, it's doing the right thing, and then can be built up, tested and deployed sort of in an agile way where you're consistently extending it, expanding it, and you understand how it works and you can adjust your organisation to, to deal with that. Um, you need to have a way for actively monitoring for bias and fairness. You need good governance and technology controls. You need good processes, data, privacy, security, all needs to be you know, covered to some degree. And these are all areas that organisationally you'll learn into, um, but you've got to start small. And you need diligent and ongoing human oversight and review. Um, you, you, you know, trust but qualify or trust but verify, whatever that uh, saying is, kind of applies here if, if it, uh, you know, as a really important um, uh, component. 
So I guess my 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 broad landscape for kind of thinking about this stuff is is sort of sits on these two axes, and that is what is the scope of the business case or the use case that I'm thinking of? And what is the potential impact? And I'm not necessarily saying whether that impact is good or bad. I'm just saying, how big is it? You know, is it going to uh, affect every citizen in Australia and, and it could have a huge impact on their income or their ability to get a job or something like that? Uh, or is it going to have small targeted impacts that, um, that uh, uh, your organisation is, is able to deal with, you know, if it does go good or does go bad? Um, that that's containable. And then your scope is you don't necessarily want to be starting off with something that's that's going to deal with an entire end-to-end -end business process. You might want to be looking at, uh, you know, small components of a business process. Look at those bits that are part of an existing process where there's a, a step or so which is very complicated and where an AI is strong and you can deploy an AI just into that very specific um, component and again, learn and test and understand how it works. And then you can start to, as you know, how this stuff actually is operating in that context, start to expand the remit, maybe extend the scope or move it into higher impact customer um, domains. So sort of a few examples here. I don't know that these are perfect on this sort of scale, but they sort of give you a sense. Um, you know, very low, very low impact, very targeted type things. You know, I've got an AI doing my antivirus scanning uh, all the way through to very broad scope, very high impact. I've got autonomous vehicles, you know, that's sort of the maybe the, the, the two ends of the spectrum. Uh, I've got two items that are sort of highlighted here, the purple one and the green one. And I suppose those sort of demonstrate perhaps uh, some ideas where you start relatively small, like license plate recognition um, and then but there is there is you can then expand that out so as you become more competent maybe that might expand out into issuing park parking infringements um, maybe then it, it might expand out into you know running red light infringements or speeding infringements or whatever so there are there are lots of ways of building up using AI from small containable activities through to you know, business transformation, process transformation, um, you know, saving a whole lot of people from a whole lot of drudge work um, and, and sort of moving up the, up the capability and experience continuum. Um, so one of the things that I, I found along the way, and this is sort of a watch this space, I think, is the OAC, OECD AI classification model. Um, and they're trying to come up with a way of being able to understand and classify and score how good or how bad or how useful an AI system is. Um, and they haven't, they've done a lot of work, but they haven't published their full model yet. Uh, but they have started to publish the basis of some of their model. And that is, uh, they've got this great uh, breakdown here of what they see as the four key areas of, um, of the AI system. And I think that's, I quite like it. It maps very well to my earlier model about how to train an AI. Um, and you can you can sort of match those two things together. But they're saying, look, there's really these four areas that you need to be looking at when you're considering whether an AI is 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 good for a particular use case or whether a particular AI is good for your organization. And that is context, data and input, AI model, and the task and output. Uh, what they have developed so far is this broad level model. Um, and they've also developed a bunch of principles for AI. Uh, they had two categories of that, one organizational category and one a policy category. Their policy stuff's pretty much sort of aimed at um, nation states, but their AI principles, I think, are really strong and quite useful. So where you've got to look at potentially developing principles for your own use of AI in an organization, I think their, their starting point, their framework is a really strong one. So watch this space um, if you're interested in how to better understand AI, how to classify it, um, how to how to think about what AIs are going to be good for you or not. Um, I'm certainly very excited to see what these guys eventually publish. Um, I think I'm kind of out of time right now.
Um, but if you have an example you'd like to show us, I think everybody would probably appreciate that. There's a lot of um, commentary around how pragmatic the presentation is, Nicholas. So if you have one example you could show, that would be amazing. Sure. Um, so, I mean, it, I've put up a few examples here, which are ones that our organisation or practitioners within our business have been involved in. Um, and these first two are quite closely linked because they, I think these these two organisations worked um, together um, or we our practitioners work with them both. But this is an example. Let's take the revenue New South Wales um, example. And the issue was, you know, that there are various things that people might do that, that might result in them getting a fine because they're not they're not following the law. And they had this issue where, you know, there were a bunch of people who would continuously be kind of pinged uh, for, for for not following the law because they just didn't have a lot of money and they were they were um they were uh you know had issues in 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 their societal kind of interactions um and and there wasn't there's no point in continuing to to kind of take punitive action against these sort of people so what they what they decided to do was put together an intervention program where they used ai to look at uh, a whole bunch of data sets that they had on these people to basically try to preempt that that certain people would be likely to face a fine in the near future, and then they would identify those people and start to look at whether they put them into some sort of intervention kind of program that they could get ahead of, um, so that they're helping those people to avoid it rather than just continuously issuing fines and then dealing with the fact that they'll never get paid and it just makes everybody's life hell, etc. And they built this as an in-house solution, um, which was one of their early forays. And so following a lot of the principles and things that we talked about, they started really small. They started with a bunch of open source tools. Um, they they kind of stitched them together and, and wrote the, the code that kind of made it work. And they, they slowly then built it up um, to, uh, to test whether it was viable, whether it could do what they wanted, um, et cetera. Um, another example is uh, the Revenue New South Wales traffic flow analysis. So um, they were using computer vision and object detection, drone tracking, camera-based traffic sy systems to basically analyze, you know, um, high impact traffic accident zones and look at, you know, what they could do to re-architect the roads or fix uh, potholes managing logistics, diverting traffic, uh, all sorts of interventions that they could possibly take to um, to reduce their the, the likelihood that certain areas will become kind of black spots and things like that. Awesome, Nicholas. Thank you. Really fantastic examples. And actually, we had um, Nat in the chat ask an example, ask a question of, can you share any examples, good, not so good, of where AI has been used in evaluation for government? Um, particularly in relation to efficiency of data collection or analysis. Um, and then also, I guess, as an additional component to that question, are government, in your opinion, taking the necessary steps to prepare to use AI more? Um, so on the first point, I don't have any examples. We did do a whole lot of running around to try and see, you know, where uh, where we had specific insights of AI use in evaluation, um, and we didn't have any specifically. But um, I think it is an area where there's a lot of opportunity. Mm. Um, and and I'm, I'm not particularly pro-AI or against AI. I'm sort of hedging my my bets. There, there's clearly a lot of advantage here, but I'm certainly not a, you know, apply AI to everything kind of person. Um, but I think there are there is a lot of, heavy data lifting within the evaluation uh, practice community. And I think the ability to do the sort of work you would do and then also feed similar data through an AI, perhaps in a parallel kind of process as a way of checking what work you've done or looking for other opportunities or other insights into the data that you're working with um, is huge because you can, you can get a whole pile of observations or outputs or potential insights and just go, nah, like this AI has totally got the wrong end of this stick, just throw that away. Or, wow, 
it, it has spotted this pattern and we would never have looked at it. Um, I mean, one of the examples I, I like to give people is um, if I go back here, uh, back in 2019, uh, no one will have heard of this. I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan. No one else will have heard of it, but there's a video game called Dota. Um, it's one of the largest competitive sports in the world. The last world championships, the prize pool was 45 uh, million American dollars for the for the the teams playing, and the winning team took away half of that, uh, or third, sorry, a third of that pool. Uh, it's one of the biggest games on the planet. But one of the very first public things that OpenAI did was they taught the AI to play this game, and it's super complicated. There's five characters per side. Uh, it, the games run typically for 45 minutes to an hour and a half or hour, let's say, uh, and hugely complex. Uh, eventually, they got the, the the game's AI to the point where it could pretty much beat any professional team in the world with a selected pool of only like out of 100 characters, it could play 20. And if it played those 20, it would pretty much win every game. What was interesting, though, was people watched the games, analysts and players watched the games, and they watched what these AI bots did and they said we never do that we don't understand why the AI is doing that why are they doing that and winning it makes no sense like we've ruled this strategy out years ago uh, and so they gained all these insights into how the bot played and and the bot learned from you know, just just playing the game hundreds and thousands and millions of iterations until it found all these strategies that human players and human coaches had never ever considered before so there's that opportunity potentially for insights that humans because we're also biased or we work in certain ways uh, might never uh spot yeah thanks david good to have another dota fan <laughs> you've got a buddy in the chat thanks, um, i have a question from jennifer um and i think this is something that a lot of people are quite interested in um Certainly for me, I work for a specialist family violence and sexual assault organization. So sort of privacy and local data storage is really important. Um, so the question is, are there any AI that can be downloaded as local instances um, that is allowing data to be stored locally? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, this is definitely one of the futures of AI, not necessarily the future, but a future. So I think at this point in time, there's a couple of, very specific examples of this. Uh, I mean, one is, for example, if you look at Copilot, Microsoft's implementation, um, it 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 does a couple of things. So it has it has its main uh, large language model, which runs kind of centrally, uh, but then every tenant who you know every organization who has their own Microsoft uh, deployment, it maintains its own local data set which is based on what it knows about you and your organization. So it's read all your SharePoint documents, it's read all your emails, it's read all your to-do lists, et cetera. But that data set stays local to your uh, Microsoft instance and doesn't go outside the organization. Uh, and then also when, when I as an individual ask Copilot a question or ask it to do something, it knows out of that local store of information that it has about my business, it knows what documents I have access to and which documents I don't. So it will only include components of that that I have access to as an individual. And it will, whilst it leverages the central AI to help um, uh, answer the question and do some of the, you know, the, the really heavy lifting around the, the large language model, um, the data largely remains within my business. The, the central AI is never, trained or never learns from your local data set only the local instance gets improved based on um you know what it knows about your business that that's one instance and the other instance that is kind of coming along um, and i think will be a really big deal um shortly is what they call small language models uh, and similar things which are ai uh, models that have been paired right back so that they're small enough to be able to run on a on a device and, you know, people may or may not know it, but I don't know if the camera's going to focus, but, you know, all your Apple devices have a very, very capable uh, AI um, hardware built in specifically designed for running AI and large language models or language models and things like that. And so 
Apple and Microsoft and some other researchers are starting to release small versions of uh, other existing AIs so that they can run on your local device. And I think that, um, and Apple, I think, released eight of their small language models or small AI models as open source about a month ago. Um, and I think that sort of personalised AI will become a big thing. Um, so running it on the local device where it knows all of your local information and can be heavily personalised for you. Um, if you think about Apple's big, big value proposition, their big, big value proposition proposition is protecting your privacy. I personally think that's probably one of the reasons why they're a bit behind on the AI race at the moment, because I think they recognise that where development's going right now doesn't match their model of protecting your privacy. Um, and so they're sort of uh, hopefully keeping their powder dry or developing the whole AI kind of construct in a bit of a different direction. Um, and I'm I'm kind of excited to see what they can do when they're actually running AI on my thing. They, they do it now. Like if you've seen, you know, you can open up your photos and just select and it'll do an auto select of just a part of the photo, the person or the car or whatever the object is in the thing. And you drag that off. That's all done by AI and what have you. But I think they'll be expanding that I hope into um, other really clever, unique areas. Awesome. Thank you. Great answer. Um, so Laurie actually asked early on, and we might be getting into like probability of doom territory here, Nicholas, but um, can you give an example of AI acting on its outputs without human intervention, whether that's, you know, that's examples that are happening now, currently in place, or that um, that could be? And actually Emma gave an example from a Harvard Business Review piece um, around AI, not just interviewing applicants, but then also recommending who should be considered for the job. So I suppose that's that's possibly what you're talking about? I don't know. I, I, suppose, I suppose that's pretty close. I would say the end-to-end the -end version of that is that you just get si sent a signed contract and the person turns up tomorrow morning. You know, like maybe, maybe that's the possibility. I mean, at the very least in that process that you described, you're getting a recommendation from an AI and then you're still having to make some sort of human decision about whether this person is really, you know, the right person for the job or not. Um, so... I suppose there are some elements of that use case that's a bit creepy. Um, but I would say ultimately there is a human intervention there. You know, you're gonna um you're gonna get, I don't know, like a thousand applicants at the at the start of the funnel, and then you're gonna get a very small handful of them that are like recommended by AI for the job. But then you've still got to look at them, read them, perhaps give them a call, make a decision, whatever. Um, so I'd say maybe that, maybe that's not too scary. Do you have like, a scary example? Well, we all know how much we hate interviews and hiring people, right? I don't know. It's tough gig. Do you have, do you have any scary examples there, Nicholas? Um, look, I think, I think there's stuff probably going on that we just don't know about. Um, I think that it, like this is a gold rush kind of scenario, um, you know, similar to, you know, the social media rush and the the web web rush of the two thousands, all that sort of thing. Um, so there's there's probably stuff going on that we just don't know about. I think the fraud kind of angle um, is is what uh, is really obviously very um, problematic, and that is the ability for um, AI to generate, you know, uh, fraud scenarios and to then generate, you know, if you think about phishing emails that you get, you know, the ability of an AI to generate um, phishing emails that are just so convincing that can be totally personalised. We call that spear phishing. You know, you're trying to hit the CFO and get them to transfer money. Um, you know, the ability to tailor that really specifically for that individual based on what you know about them from their LinkedIn profile and their posts on Reddit or whatever uh, is pretty scary. Um, but then further than that, the ability for them to mimic voices and faces and things like that. There have been instances in the US of, you know, um, AI mimicking um, President Biden 
calling people with Biden's voice and telling them not to go to the voting booth today in the in the local state voting polls and things like that. Um, that sort of stuff is is probably the worst. Um, like that is actively deviant and actively subversive. Um, other things, you know, you can put them down to there's definitely some people that are just trying to make money out of this or or just trying to uh, not be outpaced by their competitors and then perhaps do something that's um, a bit of groupthink or a bit, uh, uh, you know, not, not that great for society. But I think it's that active fraud, disseminate disinformation kind of domain that I think is really um, the big negative area right now. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nicholas. And thank you for such a pragmatic and clear presentation. Um, just a reminder that those slides will be sent out to all attendees um, after this session. Um, and a reminder too, um, I think sort of building on what Nick's been talking about there, um, tomorrow we have the great debate happening at 12 p.m. So please do come along to that and sort of hear the the different sides uh, to the AI debate. And then I'll also be hosting the Festival Club where we'll look at um, just having a bit of a play around with prompting and sort of what, what we can produce um, with AI. Um, and thanks to everybody in the chat for all of your amazing engagement and responses. And especially Christy, you've been amazing in providing resources um, and